Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome everybody to uh, today's London Climate Action Week uh, event uh, called CBA 16 and locally led adaptation and interactive dialogue. Uh, today's event is part of our CBA conference series. Uh, the CBA conference this year will take place, uh, I should say again, the community-based adaptation conference is a practitioner's focused conference on adaptation. Uh, it's uh, um, something that is now in its 16th year and uh, this year's conference will be uh, in October on the 3rd and 4th and there will be a little bit more on that uh, later. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the locally led adaptation principles and asking uh, what does it look like to apply them in practice? What does success look like from the ground up? And what do we want to see for the locally led adaptation principles uh, in the future? Um, we have a really great line of speakers today uh, um, from around the world. Some of them recorded, some of them are, are live and in person with us today. Uh, and we're really looking forward to a, to a fascinating session. Without further ado, I want to hand over now to Professor Salim Hook, who is the director of the Inter International Centre for Climate Change and Development based in Bangladesh, to uh, uh, introduce us to the principles for locally led adaptation. Over to you, Salim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you at this webinar of the London, London Climate Action Week um, for the 16th uh, annual conference of community-based adaptation. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, give you a little bit of a history of uh, how we came to be where we are on this issue. Um, as you can figure out from the number 16, we've been doing this for well over 16 years. I started it when I used to be at IID in London. Uh, and we have this annual conference on community-based adaptation, which has evolved over time into a broader concept that we now call locally-led adaptation. Uh, the difference between the two, it's not a big difference, but it is a, a nuanced difference, is that community-based adaptation started primarily in the civil society sector. It was NGOs uh, working with uh, vulnerable communities in vulnerable countries who are beginning to be aware of the impacts of climate change and the need to understand those impacts and how to adapt those communities or help the communities adapt uh, to the impacts of climate change uh, that we used to get together every year uh, um, annually, a physical event in a different country every year. Over the years, we've been in Africa and Asia, um, but in the last couple of years, because of the pandemic, we have become virtual. And this year as well, on, in October, we will continue to be virtual. Uh, but in the last couple of years, we have had a major development in the adaptation sector called the Global Commission on Adaptation. This was uh, uh, headed by Mr. Ban Ki-moon, the former Secretary General, together with Kristalina Georgieva, then at the World Bank, now at the IMF, and Mr. Bill Gates of the Bill and Gate, Melinda Gates Foundation, and a number of very, very big luminary uh, commissioners. And they worked for two years on adaptation and, and brought out a series of action tracks on adaptation. There were eight different action tracks. One of those action tracks was on locally led adaptation. And we were very much the, the product of that eighth action track on locally led adaptation. And we have built a community of practice. We developed the eight principles of adaptation, uh, locally led adaptation. We got more and more organizations and funders and governments to sign up to those principles. And I'm not sure what the number is now, but I think we're reaching a hundred uh, organizations and governments and, and funding agencies who have signed up uh, to those principles, the eight principles of uh, locally led adaptation. And we're very, very pleased uh, that that is happening. So we are now at the point of segueing from adopting principles to practicing those principles. And I'll say a little bit about why we need to do that and how we plan to do that. The why is very much in the, um, I apologize for having a sore throat. Uh, um, uh, I, I, I hope I won't end up coughing, but the why is very much predicated on the a recent uh, sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Working Group One report made it very clear that climate change impacts are now happening already, attributable to human-induced climate change. No longer something that's going to happen in the future that we need to prepare for. And we are not adequately prepared. Working Group Two, which came out a few months later at the end of February this year, 
uh, reinforce that message saying that there are hundreds of examples of impacts of climate change happening and the inadequacy of our adaptation. Whether we be a poor country or a rich country, none of us are adequately adapted or prepared for the impacts. And they are now happening both in rich as well as poor countries, no longer something only poor countries needed to worry about. And therefore we need to emphasize and we need to invest a lot more uh, in adaptation. And uh, fortunately in the last conference of parties in COP26 in Glasgow, this was uh, accepted as a principle. Uh, developed countries accepted that they had not provided sufficient funds for adaptation. They promised to double the amount of funding for adaptation, and we hope that they will be able to fulfill that promise. Uh, there are uh, signs that they are moving in the right direction, but we need them to move uh, much faster. However, there was a second order message as well on adaptation from the IPCC, where they had looked at impacts of climate change and adaptation in interventions, and they found a surprisingly large number of adaptation interventions that didn't actually work effectively. And in fact, some of them were made things worse than they were before. They were maladaptive. And so we need to be very careful about what do we do with the funding for adaptation that is made available either from international sources or national sources. And we need to be much, much more careful in ensuring that they actually uh, help the victims of the impacts of climate change. And while there are many reasons for the ineffectiveness of these interventions, one primary reason that has been identified by the IPCC authors is the lack of consultation with the local participants. Uh, Almost all the examples that they had were either international agencies flying into a country with a bunch of money and saying, this is what you have to do, or national governments deciding for local communities, this is what you have to do, and then making them do it, and then finding that it didn't really help very much. And the lack of consultation with local people was the number one missing element in the lack of success in adaptation interventions. And that's something we all need to learn from. We all need to accept. The acceptance of the eight principles is to accept that failure. We accept failure. And now we say we are going to do things better. And so now we are moving into how do we make things better? And this uh, CBA conference is a way to do that. We need to listen, listen more carefully to the voices of the people at the front lines, accept them, uh, and, ex and accept their experiential knowledge on the basis of which we can then build and support them rather than tell them what we think they need to be doing. There's been too much top-down expert-led, quote-unquote le expert-led uh, interventions that really have not proved to be very uh, fruitful in the end. So we need a combination of top-down and bottom-up and the CBA conference is very much the voice of the bottom up. How do we ensure the voices of the most affected communities to inform decision making at local level, at national level, and at global level? And the way we have structured this over the next uh, few years, the coming years of this decade, is we will be doing three events a year. The first event, the first uh, part of the year, is a annual conference that my center organizes called Gobeshona. Gobeshana is a Bangla word for research, and we have a global community of uh, locally led act, uh, adaptation and resilience actors. Uh, we have been holding this conference at the early part of each year, bringing them together, a global uh, a community of practice from around the world. Uh, these are uh, practitioners and researchers looking at what are we learning on adaptation. And then uh, during the middle of the year or the second half of the year, we have the annual CBA conference, the Com Community-Based Adaptation Conference, which will be on the 3rd and 4th of October, as you heard. And this uh, brings together the practitioner community, people who are actually doing things on the ground, um, largely NGOs, a lot of local governments now very much involved, many UN agencies, funding agencies and others. Are, this is now a fast growing a community of practice on locally led adaptation to share our knowledge, share our experience and to learn from each other. And then the third event every year, as you know, is the big conference of parties that is held under the UN Framework Convention. Last year, it was in Glasgow in Scotland. This year, it will be in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, where um, not everybody will 
uh, be able to fly there and participate. But those of us who will, will be there will be able to bring the messages from the Gobeshana conference and the CBA conference to those decision makers at the COP and ensure that the voices from the front lines actually feeds into this global decision making process that takes place at the COP each year. So uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you. I look forward to uh, further discussions and, and uh, uh, taking part in, in uh, this discussion going forward and hopefully having something very concrete to take forward to Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt in November this year uh, for COP27. Just let me end by saying that there is a very big opportunity at the moment on adaptation uh, in the UNFCC process, which is the Glasgow Sharm El Sheikh work program on the global goal on adaptation. There is a global goal on adaptation that we agreed in Paris in Article 7 of the Paris Agreement, but we never agreed what it would be. We just agreed there shall be a global goal on adaptation. We now have two years to figure out what that will be. And so this is a very good opportunity for us to think about maybe there should be a locally led adaptation global goal. And let's see what we can do about that. I personally feel that that's something we, we might want to think about and see whether we can figure it out and, and put it forward as a proposal. I'll stop there for now, hand back to uh, uh, Sam or, or Shuji. <laughs> Thank you, Salim, for that. And uh, certainly that uh, locally dead adaptation goal may be something to pitch at the panel uh, later on today. So I'm going to hand over now to Sushila Pandit. It's time that we heard from you, the participants. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Sushila, who is a PhD candidate at Kent University on uh, uh, climate adaptation policy and a long-term adaptation practitioner and participant in, in CBA events as well as some of the others. Um, so over to you, Sushila. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, as Sam has mentioned, this is time to hear from the participants. As Salim has already mentioned, uh, this is the right time to frame what we want to put it on, on the adaptation, global goal on adaptation. So we want to hear from all of you uh, how we want to move it forward. So we want to hear from you uh, initially, as we mentioned, it's a practitioner event. CBA itself is a practitioner event and we come from a uh, different part of the world. So uh, we want to hear from you, like which country are you from and uh, where are you from? So just to have an overview, like how, how many and which country we are covering in this uh, webinar. Just to add, the link is also in the chat to the yeah. Mentimeter. I think people are used to Zoom meetings now, so we don't have to brief about like how to go to Menti and how to use the code. We can already see a lot of uh, countries coming on. We have a mix of people over here from Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, France, Italy to UK, Germany, US, Zimbabwe, Thailand. So we have multiple continents representing us today. I can see there's still there's a few people uh, looking for the links to Sheila, but uh, so maybe okay. just give another minute. Good to see okay, a big sure. Uganda contingent where I'm based as well yeah. as Bangladesh. It's great. So the link will be shared by Amy on the chat. So, okay, we have a huge representation from Bangladesh, Uganda, also from UK and Germany. So we have a nice mix also from Pakistan, Somalia, Japan, Austria, Ghana, Senegal. Thank you, everyone. So we are moving to our the next slide. So uh, already we have already had this rolling slide on LLA, and I hope you you are you may be aware and may not be aware of the locally led adaptation principles. We can learn more from here as well. So we are just asking on one to five how you rate. Uh, how well you understand the locally led uh, adaptation principles. So how familiar are you with this? 
we have a mix of everyone then. So what are the LLA principles is the one if you are not aware of what LLA principles are. You have just heard this today or you have just heard it now, but you still want to explore. You can click on the what are the LLA principles question mark. We have a huge bunch of people who have a decent understanding of the principles, but could not know, uh, but could know more. So, yeah, somewhere in the middle. Hope this two hour session will be very fruitful for the people who are mentioning. I know, uh, uh, like, what are the LLA principles? I want to know more. Uh, I'm aware, but uh, have uh, like, want to know more or I have a decent understanding and want to know more. So we're still waiting for a few more seconds. And then we will move. So we have like five LLA champions. I know all about it in detail. So five of the LLA champions are on the room. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I hope you are uh, representing some organization or you are doing some research as well. So how you or your organization is already applying the LLA principles? So if yes, please click yes. If no, then no. And as Salim also mentioned, we are uh, still having this learning on new uh, Although it's been a CVA's uh, modified or Im improvised version, we are still new on LLA. It's launched last year only. So we are, we are aware that it may be, we, we may be doing LLA, but we are not aware of it. No problem with that. This is a platform where we want to learn and explore and test as well whether our work is supporting LLA or not. So no problem and there is right, no right and wrong. There is no yes and no. This is just to have an observation like uh, what is going around in the world so that we can gather this information and let's uh, work together on it. Okay, so we have around a lot of people like 37 of them already working on LLA principles. And we are happy to have like 23 who 24 who will be who will be doing the LLA in the future, I think. Already not started then. Thank you, everyone. Let's move to the next question then. Okay, as we mentioned, there are like eight principles on the LLA. Uh, so which principle of LLA is most relevant for your work? So which one is the one you prioritize on your work? Feel like this is really, uh, this is the area that I'm working on. So we have highlighted uh, this, uh, we have put on uh, the eight principles. Also, you can click on this so image. I will just show it. If you so have this, you have the details of each principle. So you can, I think we will not have time to go through all of these details, but if you want to just verify whether you are clicking the right one, you just can click this and then come back and then come back and put your, uh, put your, which principle you are supporting mostly on. So it's uh, principle one, two, three, four, which one you are doing or the eight, transparency and accountability. Oh, now the principle will be shifted as per the category. Sorry for that. <laughs> I didn't realize that previously. No problem with that. Uh, Okay, yeah, good going. The first one is building on, building a robust understanding of climate risks and uncertainty. Flexible programming and learning, devolving decision-making to the lowest appropriate level. That's really nice to hear. We are still waiting for you. If you have any problem on clicking it, please get back to Amy. Amy will support us on getting the code or the link for you.
So understanding climate risks and uncertainty and decision making for the lowest appropriate level is getting in the top. So most of us feel like these tools are the area we are working on. We still see like there is an opportunity to work on transparency and accountability and prioritizing uh, patent and persistable funding, which is, uh, which is a tough area as, as we all know, uh, funding areas and the accountability, uh, the governance side of it. So still a lot of work to be done on that part. We are still uh, have to do a lot of it on, on that area, but we are so happy to see that uh, most of our work are supporting on devolving the decision making and the lowest appropriate level and building the climate risks and uncertainty and investing on long term local capabilities. That's really good to hear. Mm, so we want to move to the next slide. If you want to have your work to be placed on, please just have the click which principle you are following, which principle your work is supporting. Great. So thank you so much. So devolving decision making is really making a, a very smooth <laughs> pick compete together with uh, climate risks and uncertainty and long term local capabilities. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we will be now moving to the next one. So uh, as we mentioned, like there is a lot of uh, work we need to do on the LLA. It's not like a top-down approach. You have a fixed program and you run it. It's like more involved with local communities and things. So what are the barriers you have found while delivering the LLA in practice? So we want to hear from you, like what, as Salim was also mentioning, like there are the barriers and we need to learn from the barriers. We need to, we need to uh, have this understanding so that we can better prepare everything. Uh, the community can better prepare themselves. So what are the barriers that you have uh, have in, in your practices, in your uh, work on the ground uh, that we can learn from, that all of us can learn from? Because as we see, we come from different uh, geography. We come from Africa, from Asia, from Europe, from the US. Uh, we have all variety of barriers as well, which, which could be, uh, specific to a geography or maybe uh, worldwide barriers, like worldwide problems for everyone. So we want to hear from you uh, what barriers you are uh, having on delivering this LLA principle on practice. So funding is coming on number one. Funding is a big, big uh, bundle over there. Financing, funding, little climate change finance, so when this is a sorry, this is a word cloud. So if you put a single word, it will be interesting to have a group of word coming together. Lack Just to time. add that it's also possible to add more than one answer. So if you do think of more yeah. than one, go for it. Yeah. Put it in there. So coming as funding, the access to financing, monitoring and evaluation, lack of resource, power imbalance. Oh my God, how many barriers we have there, but we still, we still focus on doing the things. You can see like this, the boxes are getting so small and small. The literacy, the policy, power, finance, uh, racism, poverty, coordination, funding consistency, a lack of understanding, finance to local level, culture of appreciation, centralized decision-making, um, monitoring and evaluation, uh, lack of motivation, power imbalance. So a lot of things are coming around uh, over here. Maladaptation uh, practices promoted as well. Somebody has mentioned it on it. Uh, lack of accountability, lack of time, fixed mindset, political interference, Omen excluded, the understanding, few actors. So we, we have like little 
uh, little actors, or like or only a limited actors, a limited time for the project. So we have like three year to five years of project where we dream for a transformation. That's also true. Unawareness, resources. Uh, that's really interesting. So thank you very much, Sushila. It's great. Do keep those answers coming in if you're thinking of more. It's great to see them and we'll be uh, putting out a magnifying glass <laughs> to study those in more detail <laughs> yes, after true. the session. So um, thank you so much. I will stop the slide now. Thank you so great. much, everyone, for your input. Thank you so much. So it's time now to hear a little bit about locally led adaptation from around the world. Uh, and we have a short video to show you, which gives a little flavor of what local adaptation might look like and what local adapters want to see when it comes to locally led adaptation. Um, this is also a good opportunity to think of any questions that arise for you for the panel. So use the Q&A function if you've got anything you want the panel to discuss. Uh, um, uh, uh, please do put it in the Q&A. And of course, there's plenty to chew on coming out of that Mentimeter as well. So if we can cue the video, please. Thank you. What I would love local adaptation to look like is the inclusion of children in participating in local adaptation. What I mean is children being involved in knowledge acquisition and children also being part of the behavior change communication that is targeted in communities. An example is like the community you work with, which is predominantly a pastoral community. In the future, I would love that uh, local adaptation programs focus on the children. And so in this way, children can be able to also participate and understand other livelihood options that will help them uh, mitigate issues surrounding disaster management. In Honduras, the temperatures are increasingly higher. In Honduras, the temperatures are increasingly higher. Y los tiempos, la época seca del año es más larga. And the dry seasons are larger too. Y el tiempo de invierno, eh, las lluvias no son tan bien distribuidas. In winters, the rain seasons are not well distributed. El llamado a la acción eh, o las acciones eh, es pues implementar prácticas de adaptación al cambio climático. And the actions are to implement practices for adaptation to climate change. Tanto en agricultura. Culture, eh, medidas que permitan que los agricultores tengan mayor resiliencia. In a way that uh, the farmers have more resilience. Que implica el uso yeah. adecuado del agua, eh, el uso de semillas adaptadas al clima seco. Like they use uh, the sustainable use of water and the seeds, the use of seeds that are adapted to dry seasons. Y los retos o los desafíos es tener mayor integración entre sociedad civil y gobierno. The main challenges are the integration between the civil society and government. Para un trabajo más eficiente con la participación también de las comunidades. For a more efficient work uh, of the participation of communities. What we are doing uh, from Nepal is um, mostly we try to uh, address this uh, impact through uh, mostly through uh, agriculture. So as Nepal is agriculture based economy. We try to uh, provide them more with um, technology. Like for example, uh, the high mountain people, the food is sufficient for only six months. We try to uh, train people and we give, try to give technologies, knowledge, like access to the government services so that they can increase that food availability once at least. So in that process, we connect, to, connect them to the government services like for example um, weather information one small example try to design a seasonal calendar according to the changes that are happening technologies like water efficient technologies like drip irrigation and uh, more of a uh, greenhouse uh, planting it's very uh, not sufficient what we are uh, doing since the climate induced disasters are becoming more frequent and the communities are not connected to the um, data, uh, like forecast, like future forecast, like what's going to happen. If we could connect our communities to these um, digital information that uh, is forecasted, 
so that the community become more prepared in future. So our main role would be to connect uh, communities to the uh, digital information and as well as to build their capacity. It is required that build their capacity to be resilient to the changes that's going to happen in future. La Corporación Cultural Ecológica Mujer Tejer Isabeles Mutesa es una iniciativa de crear un espacio de elaboración de helados de frutas silvestres amazónicas, pero detrás de esto hay un proceso muy importante, es la conservación de la semilla y de la seguridad alimentaria en los territorios indígenas. Con ese cambio climático, créame que en el departamento del Amazonas va, va a llegar el tema del hambre, porque ya las siembras no serán iguales como los años anteriores. La deforestación, la minería ilegal, la exploración petrolera, entre otros, está causando una desarmonía y un desequilibrio a la madre naturaleza y sus habitantes. Roof Over Our Heads is a part of global campaign of What Women Want. Millions of poor people build their houses from recycled materials that are available to them. And roofing is a critical part of the house. It's usually made from asbestos sheets cement roofing, tin sheets, tarpaulins, acrylic, plastic, etc. And because they are high on carbon footprint, these choices do not fit local adaptation practices. We cannot blame poor people for making intuitive choices based on survival. We need today is new alternatives that come from working together with women in these communities. New knowledge that emerge out of scientific knowledge backed with conventional wisdom and data that is collected and owned by communities. Thank you for sharing that video. And I want to uh, uh, give a big thank you to all of the partners that made the time to share those little snapshots of what adaptation might look like uh, um, in, in different parts of the world. So I'm going to hand over now to Shuchi Vora, Programme Officer at the Global Resilience Partnership, who will introduce our panel for today. Over to you, Shuchi. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Hi, everyone. Um, I am going to kick off a set of presentations by our panelists and then get into a, an in-depth panel discussion uh, today. And very excited to welcome our four panelists. We have first up uh, Polly, who is who works with the Rural Women Network in uh, Kenya and Uganda. And Pauline, would you uh, mind sharing your and would you mind coming up on video so that we can hear your presentation first? Thank you very much. Maybe just a correction. I, I don't work in Uganda. I only work with Rural Women Network in Thank Kenya. You. And maybe uh, to add to the introduction, uh, we are also members of the Wairu Commission. Rural Women Network is a grassroots women-led platform that brings together rural grassroots women, smallholder agriculture producers in four counties. We have 47 counties in Kenya. We work with over 600 households alongside the national and county government. It's very important to work with the government uh, locally and uh, even nationally because of continuity and sustainability. Rural women main focus is food, nutrition, and economic security while championing climate smart and conservation agriculture. We empower rural women, rural grassroots women to take charge, build and restore their livelihoods through capacity building and enterprise development. We are imparting agriculture skills to the pastoralist women who are embracing crop agriculture. Like the photo you, can, you, you are seeing there is uh, taken in front of a cone garden because of drought and climate change impact pastoralism is, uh, is, is being affected and animals have to move. Um, advocate for grassroots women to participate, lead and benefit from agriculture and rural development. The women are not involved in decision-making as much as we know we are the, the main actors in the agriculture sector. We advocate for climate justice uh, and social inclusion to build resilience to climate change, address social inequality and discrimination against women, girls, and marginalized people. Women are disproportionately affected because they are the ones who fish water, firewood, and all that. And also at, at, at the, the place of climate change as scarce resources. Next slide. 
Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, during the CBA 15, we did apply with other organizations for their catalytic fund, and which we were awarded. Catalytic grants aim to foster collaboration and continuity between participants at the CBA and Gobeshona conferences. Five teams have received uh, seed grants to develop innovative ideas with new partners. Rural Women Network, Shibuya Community Health Workers, and Women Climate Center International uh, benefited from this fund last year. Uh, we uh, proposed to establish grassroots women led the Syrian livelihood practices and climate information learning centers in three counties to build grassroots level resilience. The three organizations come from uh, three different counties, hence the mention of the uh, three different counties. This way, we, our local solutions will inspire global action as we look to do a triplication, not just locally, but globally. The photo you are, you are seeing there is of a, a, a pastoral tube and harvesting vegetables in the, the established uh, center within their community. The climate information learning centers are one-stop farm where climate uh, solutions are on adapt community adaptation and resilience practices are disseminated, including climate smart and conservation agriculture, soil conservation, water harvesting, integrated soil fertility management, crop rotation, and farm forest. Those are all practices in the climate smart uh, uh, practices. Producing non-chemical liquid fertilizers, and it's also a platform for testing new technologies to grow food, vegetables, and trees. The catalytic grant allows rural women to deliver training in crop and conservation agriculture, distribute seedlings, and engage more women in climate smart agriculture. Those, these photos are taken from the different centers. You can see there is a well in the first photo. The second one is harvesting of the um, liquid manure from uh, the vermiculture practice. We also have the trees, the fruit tree seedlings. We encourage women to do fruit uh, seedlings because the wood trees will belong to other people when they mature. We have some women harvesting vegetables in uh, Shibuya Center. And we have the, 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 the center established at the pastoralist community with cone gardens at the bottom of some, some trees for shading. Now, locally led adaptation places the communities and local actors, and I think we have heard that from uh, the previous uh, speakers, in the front line of addressing climate change through their day-to-day -day socioeconomic livelihood activities, e.g. agricultural activities that conserve the natural resources, including soil, water, land, landscape, land cover, and forests. Locally led adaptation achieves more results with little resources. This we mean that because these are, there is ownership of the practices by the communities. Now that we have uh, we are doing a bottom up, then uh, we can use the uh, literal resources to uh, to to upgrade these uh, practices by enabling communities to make important decisions also without push by authorities or motivation by donor driven resources. Um, as a local actor, I want to see more awareness, knowledge, scaling up, and replication of locally led adaptation activities to reach uh, our out more communities for sustainability. And maybe I would mention that uh, the communities don't just want to be consulted, they want to be involved. Uh, that is our corn garden with the vegetables in one of the centers. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Pauline. That was great. That was a very inspiring presentation, if I may say so. Uh, next up, we have Anish. Uh, Anish is also a catalytic grant winner. Uh, the catalytic grants were constituted by uh, GRP, CJRS, and ICAD. And ICAD is the primary lead in uh, managing these. So, um, big thank you to both Pauline and Anish for joining this session. Uh, Anish, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Suchi, for this uh, introduction and lovely uh, connection with our this uh, small grant initiative that we implemented with the ICAD and uh, Global Resilience Partnership. To the, and also, I think uh, there was a Climate Justice Resilience Fund behind to make this initiative a success. Uh, so it's, uh, to start with my our work, uh, we had been uh, got the opportunity to work on the climate change adaptation and gender coping with the climate tricks by empowering Omen in the Omen in the mountains. Uh, this small grant project that we did 
uh, over the course of uh, last, uh, I think the last uh, month of couple of months of 2020 and uh, the till mid 2021. Uh, where we discuss and elaborated on the women's involvement and engagement and empowerment in climate through uh, mitigation and adaptation. So you can see our this initiative. Uh, just a moment. Yeah. So, uh, so this initiative was implemented in uh, Nepal and India. So we did uh, two uh, uh, focus uh, villages where we conducted uh, pilot initiative implementation. And we see how women can be engaged, empowered, and uh, build the capacity uh, for leadership development in context of developing them as a climate leaders. Uh, so our activities under this project was uh, as a part of the research uh, where we conducted the women's involvement, engagement, uh, their uh, imp impacts on them, uh, the climate change and what mitigation initiative and uh, they are already implementing in the ground and also what kind of adaptation um, measures can uh, is being applied and can be implied uh, applied in the future. So it was one of the uh, major uh, uh, work of this uh, our initiative. And then second, it was to create a sustainable women's resource center. We not only to do the research or discussion on you know how uh, we uh, what is the problem and what we are doing, but also like how we can build them uh, in a uh, in a single umbrella. Uh, so that they can have a sustainable place to convene, discuss, and transform their initiative to the next level. So, a uh, women resource uh, resource center as part of like women groups uh, that uh, usually um, it's established in villages, but uh, not with the proper structure and mandate. But this time we wanted to uh, play it more with innovativeness uh, to uh, consider um, implying and engaging them as a par part of the climate leaders initiative. So uh, the three, three was to uh, document their case studies of all of this discussion, Omen Center research, and then we also develop a video out of that. Uh, so the objective of this uh, project overall was to build the capacity and uh, training uh, to the each, uh, each one Omen group in Nepal and India uh, on the climate adaptation, and also to improve the, the community resilience uh, through agrobiodiversity pro product as a means of livelihood uh, opportunity by restoring their ecosystem based services and then the next one is to develop the climate resilience and adaptation uh, through agriculture and social entrepreneurship just to bridge uh, the existing uh, in entrepreneurial initiatives or livelihood initiatives that women are doing in the form of the uh, small scale um, uh, home industries um, uh, and cottage industries how that is contributing and ha is has a potential uh, to link it with the climate um, activism. So that was one of the, our major core uh, objectives. And then uh, again, to document and reflect upon the self-initiative though, you know, not only to discuss or to train or support the existing initiative, also to document so that we have a proper um, kind of a visualization of what is happening mm -hmm. and how we can to like inspire that uh, to others through the documentation we have. So we have this uh, documentation. Uh, on climate change with the goal of highlighting key action needed to build a future resilience. So last one uh, was to uh, this, uh, uh, restore the livelihood option opportunities of the vulnerable communities by improving ecosystem-based adaptation being threatened by climate impact. So uh, climate uh, has been impacting a lot of uh, the livelihood option, a lot of the uh, household chores also, and then also how people are engaging with the environment. So we want to uh, restore uh, this uh, to giving back to the community with the help of the uh, community-based adaptation and also how we can improve their uh, resilience uh, through new exploring new livelihood options and empowering on the existing ones. So outputs, uh, so the outputs of this initiative was to pro uh, formation of two women group uh, or, uh, oh, sorry, not women groups, uh, two women resource center in terms of three women groups each uh, in the in Nepal and India, where the women were trained and empowered on climate. The second was on the knowledge share and technical support. So we provided on knowledge sharing and they also to share the knowledge of their own, what they have been doing on mitigation and adaptation and what kind of support they are need in like to restore their livelihood through agriculture, uh, through, um, uh, through uh, um, new uh, livelihood options and also through uh, other engagement and financial opportunities to again and build the momentum forward. Uh, so form and supported women groups for climate mitigation and adaptation. So that contributed to building a climate conscious society 
uh, through the mm -hmm. women leadership. And uh, not only on that, also, as you know, uh, women are being suffered, you know, they're in the household chores due to the energy need that they need to have, which uh, is, uh, you know, usually obtained from quail and the woods that is available in the uh, village. So, but we uh, inspired them to have the energy tra transition and what kind of impacts that uh, they, that both can have in the health personal health of the individual and also to the environment. So uh, to have the more sustainable energy in terms of the climate friendly way, uh, we try to then provide with the uh, clean cooking stuffs and other uh, exploring other options for uh, the energy transition. So the last thing uh, we had is the challenges and way forward. So while implementing this kind of initiative, we have to go local. And that, uh, you know, we might not have a proper information, you know, what type of community locality it is and what is needed in the community. So we have to establish a connection with the local organization or community-based organization, CB, uh, CBOs, like the community-based adaptation to make it happen possible. So that is a problem to reach on to the actual local organization. Then uh, to provide them sustainable platform for the cross-learning and sharing, that is also one of the challenges that we need to see in the future. And uh, then uh, we need uh, not only need to stop here the initiative that we have but also to see how we can scale up we can build that and we can take this forward so we need a sustainable and scalable partnership and to with the community-based order uh, organizations um the donors uh local government agencies and interested individuals so we have to find a way to establish that and take it forward so that is also an opportunity uh, no uh, challenge uh to make people understand and bring them in the own umbrella to discuss this and i think this kind of interaction actions like uh, that we are having today in form of the CBA conference that might be a opportunity to overcome those challenges I guess uh, so yeah I am um, not to take long I wrap up it here uh, my presentation and if you have any questions and comments or inputs on this I uh, will really love to hear and uh, thank you very much and I think it's very useful and uh, very learning and very uh, motivating one of this kind of discussion on community-based adaptation. And I think locally later solution and adaptation is the future of the universe and the world. Thank you. That was that was great and a, and a sort of a very inspiring ending, if, if I may say so. You, you sort of put out a clarion call for locally led adaptation and, and how to progress with it. Um, next. So I'm very pleased to introduce Marcia Toledo, who is uh, the resilience lead with the high level champion team. And she comes in with, with great experience uh, on, on resilience and on, on funding programming of resilience uh, and also runs the Race to Resilience initiative. So Marcia, Marcia, over to you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. and. Fantastic to hear and understand the perspectives as well from the group of the speakers of the opportunities to advance locally led adaptation. So my name is Marcia Toledo. I am from Peru, recently joined the High Level Climate Champions team as the resilience lead. And as we heard, we recognize that people and communities on the front lines are, of climate change are often the most active and innovative in developing adaptation solutions. Local communities understand the local context very well, their surrounding, their nature systems, and have cultural bonds. However, these communities lack access to the resources and agency needed to implement solutions against the impacts of climate change effectively. And we, we recognize the evidence that shows that locally led adaptations ensures those solutions implemented with the communities can deliver resilience to people and nature on the time. For this reason, at the level of the high-level climate champion teams, we're working to mobilize non-state actors, which are communities, businesses, cities, regions, investors, civil society groups, and others, to accelerate adaptation and, res and enhance resilience of 4 billion vulnerable people by 2030 as part of the Race to Resilient campaign and the new agenda on resilient breakthroughs that we are developing. The four people billion goal that we have in the campaign was explicitly defined by the non-state actors, especially to the focus that all their efforts to foster adaptation interventions and resilience will benefit people and nature. And because the race to resilience fully endorses the principles of the locally led adaptation, we're playing an active role in asking our partner and in exploring how we can enhance and improve those 
actions on the ground that are supporting locally led adaptation. Our, our campaign is considering as well how we can tell the story of the process in regards of resilient attributes to, to, to recognize how communities are enhan enhancing their agency, their local knowledge, their capacity, and that richness will be also be channeled through sharing of information and communities of practice. It's critical to learn how those actions are being designed, financed and implemented, and especially measured in a way that non-state actors can be improving. It's a process to as well gain the opportunity to improve and allow more bottom-up and local actions to be at the center of decision-making. And um, obviously, we, we know uh, in this group that I'm really very keen to, to emphasize that non-state actors play an important role in deploying solutions, technology, innovations for adaptation and resilience. But we need to make sure that these efforts are incorporating local communities' knowledge, capacity, decision-making, and channeling the financial flows in that direction. This means involving local perspective in every step of the adaptation implementation from the design to the delivery, empowering and strengthening the capacity of local leaders and groups. It is critical to enable that co-creation process and to bring the lenses of equity and justice. At the level of the high level champions team, we're doubling down on that effort to elevate more the perspectives of the vulnerable communities to help inform where and how those enormous ideas and solutions that can come from non-state actors can be better channeled, implemented, and, as, and addressed. Towards the COP this year, we're eager to elevate and, 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 and encourage businesses and investment partners on the road to COP27 to adopt and promote locally led adaptation of opportunities. We're developing this resilience breakthroughs agenda where we want to embed the locally led opportunities very explicitly, as well as making sure in our reporting and, 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 and measuring of these implementation actions, how we're holding ourselves accountable to deliver locally led adaptations in practice, making the changes necessary, learning, adopting, and improving the processes. Similarly, there is this richness of these 30 partners and more than 2,500 members that are working in more than 100 countries in the campaign, where there is opportunities for highlight success stories, similar to the ones shared previously, so that we are more understanding what it means in practice locally led adaptation and can learn from it and elevate the opportunity to accelerate the implementation. Most important, the, the work of non-state actors is not an agenda on its own or separated. It has to be closely articulated with the work of the governments. We want to make sure that the NAPs, the NTCs, that national level planning are well articulated with local opportunities, with local enhancements that can happen at the level of the local communities for increasing that ambition loop, but at the same time to really truly deploy adaptation and resilience at the local level. So locally led adaptation can unlock, support and leverage enormous potential and creativity of communities to develop and implement solutions. We must challenge ourselves and make the necessary changes to accelerate resources including the finance mobilization to enhance um, locally led practice. And we must avoid that locally led as just being words. For these, we have ideas, innovations, solutions that we can elevate to better reflect this opportunity. Thank you. We are very pleased uh, to bring forth next uh, Madeline Du, who is the LDC chair based in Senegal. And she'll be giving us a brief presentation from her perspective on the LLA. Madeline? Thank you for coming on video and over to you. Thank you, Sushi. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me as a LDC chair to, 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 to participate to this uh, event. I think this. Uh, 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 really pleased to 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 to, to, to have this platform uh, allowing uh, many uh, 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 projects to be shared, uh, in particular uh, uh, local projects. And I, I just want to thank all uh, uh, 
uh, a speaker, a previous speaker, for very, very, very sharing uh, this innovative uh, uh, local uh, adaptation project. I, I, I am, uh, as I say, I'm uh, LDC's uh, a chair, and uh, as LDC chair, we, 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 we really know that uh, we, we, we have 46 countries concerned by, by, by this group. We negotiating on the climate change uh, 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 process, and we, we want to ensure that uh, uh, the most vulnerable population have their voice really on the table. And when we're talking about the most vulnerable population, we're talking about uh, 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 local communities, we're talking about uh, 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 countries who are really facing uh, climate change impact and basic I think there's a uh, 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 necessity uh, to to ensure that those communities are they uh, need them priorities due to climate uh, impact well take on board it is why as LDCs and uh, as you you have for sure in some projects we have also developed a uh, 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 LDC's vision <coughs> to ensure that the resilience of these uh, uh, poor communities, of these most vulnerable communities to climate change will be well tackled. So we're looking for having really a, a, a resilience plus uh, pathway. And in order to do that, we have also uh, set up some initiative. And one of our initiative is uh, 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 the, the initiative for effective ad adaptation and resilience. Why we do that? We, 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 we noted that uh, uh, has been mentioned, uh, uh, resource finance not go to where it's needed, in particular adaptation finance. As LDCs, we only receive at the local level, we only receive 20%, around 20% of, of the finance resource. And on this 20% uh, of adaptation finance resource, only 10% go to the local uh, level. So. We, we need really to see where uh, the, to ensure that uh, 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 most vulnerable communities have access to the resource, have access to be in a position to implement uh, uh, their needs, their priorities, because they know how to adapt. They know how to really shift from business as usual to uh, adaptation measures. So our work, on that uh, 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 approach. To do that, uh, what we're doing, as I say, uh, uh, we, we really look for, uh, 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 through this uh, uh, Life Art initiative, uh, we actually implementing this initiative with uh, a different partner who have joined this initiative. We have uh, some uh, developing countries who have joined this initiative. This initiative is uh, 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 under the leadership of LDC's countries, and we have actually some front running uh, uh, runner countries like Uganda, like uh, uh, Burkina, Bhutan, uh, around the different LDC's countries, we start implementing such a local uh, 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 approach on adaptation. I think it's key because it's key because we want as LDC to show that uh, 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 we dealing with the need of our uh, 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 population. We are the most vulnerable. We, we don't have access to fund. Our communities are really facing every year, every time climate uh, uh, some event. So we need really to ensure that resource is uh, reaching them. So this is uh, the, 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 the objective behind uh, 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 life uh, 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 LDC's initiative. Our objective is to ensure that 70% of resource dedicated uh, to, uh, to, 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 to adaptation reach really uh, the, the, the communities. Our expectation is really to ensure that we, we're gonna reduce the transaction cost because we know that there is a lot of high transaction uh, in, in, in the business process. So how to ensure that we minimize these transaction costs? This is one, and to do that, we want really uh, uh, maybe to, lead, to, 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 to minimize the intermediary between the, 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 the resource donor and uh, uh, the, 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 the community donor, because uh, the assessment show that we have a lot of intermediary, and this bring 
this high level of transaction cost. This bring, but all the resources not really go directly to the communities. So this, this, this uh, initiative is to ensure that local people are uh, uh, driving projects, building their capacity through developing and implementing the project, but also ensuring that uh, we having a clear monitoring process. I think this is important. I think uh, in, in, in the beginning, you have started talking about that monitoring, ensuring that uh, uh, rebuilding the resilience for these communities is highly important. And I think through this kind of different experiences we're having at the community's level uh, through your, your community uh, 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 adaptation approach, I think this will help us really to show but adaptation is 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 highly needed. is is a matter of urgency, and also we're showing that we're building uh, the resilience and the capacity. So to allow poor people who are victim of climate change really to overcome uh, with this uh, uh, climate uh, uh, impact uh, uh, as well. So saying that, I just want to 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 say as LDCs also, we 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 working closely with all the global communities, uh, 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 also through the, 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 the UNSCC process to ensure that finance, adaptation finance will be double. It was a, a decision taken in, in Glasgow last year. Uh, we're looking really for having a clear roadmap to ensure that finance uh, is adequately uh, 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 made available for adaptation. We're looking for ensuring that accessibility is here, quality of finance is here, really to show, to ensure that it's going directly to communities, it's going directly to local uh, uh, projects going on on adaptation in order to scale up uh, uh, the resilience, in order also to be ensure that we, we, we can uh, respond to what we're looking for is uh, building resilience and minimizing really uh, uh, the, 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 the specificity of LDCs who are really uh, facing climate hazard. I want also to mention that uh, the issue of, uh, 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 of, um, uh, of flexibilities in the process is also something we're looking for. Because we know that if I, I take the LDCs country, they are the ones who don't have the capacity really to go in big procedure. Uh, uh, in order to 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 access to the resource. So how to make the process really uh, 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 more simple? Because it's not really procedure we're gonna uh, work on. What we need is really action on the ground, and what is what the science is asking us. So how we can maybe uh, 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 work to simplify the procedure. So life are also is looking for that how to really simplify the procedure to ensure that we're having action on the ground. We're having also some uh, results coming from the action on the ground. And also this will allow us sorry, yeah, to ensure that all these communities uh, uh, will uh, uh, participate in this uh, international effort of uh, uh, reaching out of the global goal on adaptation. We're working on the global goal, but we, as been mentioned, we want to ensure that action going on the ground will fit the global goal uh, on adaptation. And we're looking in China really to, to try to gather all these experiences, all these uh, uh, looked on the table, but action needs to be scaled, scaled up because it's a matter of agency. Uh, population uh, who are in LDC uh, uh, not, don't need to wait for procedural process. They have to really adapt uh, 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 their livelihood. Uh, to climate change. I thank you very much. Thanks, Madeline. That was great. Thank you so much. And uh, could we have the panelists turn out in their video for a bit until we, yeah, until until we begin talking, and and maybe you can switch it off in a bit. Anish, Pauline. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure. Sure. Let me just. Great. Me thank you. Perfect. And I, I, we have a few questions, but we are, we are running short on time. So I will not delve, to, uh, delve into my own questions, my own bank of questions, but really dive into the audience questions directly. 
Um, and I'll start in the order of the speakers. So I'll start with Pauline uh, and I'll, I'll have one round of questions to each one of you and then maybe uh, questions that you can take in order of your expertise. So we can start with Pauline. And Pauline, there's a question on power imbalance and a lot of your work is about, about uh, building capacity. So I thought it would be a good, good um, sort of segue into talking about how can we address the power imbalance which is caused by socioeconomic status, cultural norms, gender norms, et cetera, within communities, which influence community participation in adaptation processes. So it would be great if you could uh, shed some light from your experience on this topic. Thank you very much. I, I'm not sure I, I had the last bit, but um, I'll try to respond. The running centers are not just uh, agricultural running centers, but centers where communities meet where women meet and exchange ideas, they exchange technology, which is predicted elsewhere. I, I was not able to present a bit of it where the centers are also uh, working as a peer learning uh, platform where women can meet and uh, talk about gender based violence and other vices within uh, within uh, the communities. So we can, uh, ha we can harness what is happening and uh, get to the larger community because uh, the, the women uh, by the end of the day have to get this to their, to their home level. So I think uh, we, we can build the capacity knowing that this is going to be replicated elsewhere and it's going to reach the larger community at the end of the day. And this is skills also, we have seen that women outside the centers have also replicated and they are being adopted by even people who are not associated with the centers, but they have benefited from uh, the experience and the learning from the other, uh, from those ones who are directly involved. Thank you. Anish. Uh, we have a question for you, yeah, uh, and you I'm yeah. <laughs> I'm dipping into my own uh, bank of questions for you, just to just to sort of keep it fresh. Uh, I I mean your project is super interesting because you're talking about empowering women, um, and it's all yeah. research based. So I wanted to know what the what you think are the key success factors. We've we've heard a lot about barriers to LLA, but what are the key success factors that you see? in uh, the work that you've done? Uh, so yeah, first thing uh, that I want to like highlight on this is like, you know, to bringing the omen. So it's really a, one of the great um, uh, achievement, I would say, because, you know, like omens usually in the countries like Nepal and India are limited there in, within their household because of the several socio-economical and uh, political challenges of their um, uh, accessibility and how they have been uh, treated in the society and also especially um, you know we are not talking about the women's here uh, who was uh, well educated and then you know enjoying uh, the luxury of uh, having education uh, job and all so that we usually you know going to the community where there's a several of challenges of getting education getting off the accessibility of the information and uh, to know the info uh, and also to get accumulated with of this all of this topic like climate change and all and they know that they have been uh, being victim or having been in a problem in the through you know some weather change and all but you know they don't know the concept actually of the what is the climate change is and uh, you know how it is being impacting so this is one of the i think key achievement that we first you know uh, get to uh, reach to those omens and then to tell them you know what is the problem what is the possibilities of not only of having a problem but to explore of what we can bigger make out of that program as the adaptation is one of the crucial opportunity we have uh, so that is one achievement, and the second is to bring them in a, under one umbrella, under one roof, as omen groups, you know, and to form them uh, as a resource center. So not only one omen knows everything, but that key we have the system or that we have the a platform where uh, people can share with each other, and then everybody knows everything. I mean, at least of what we are discussing, and then they can move with the, their sustainable initiative, the grow that, and also take it forward. So uh, it's an information and um, you know technical expertise, and then the resources sharing platform, such as the Women Resource Center, was of uh, great thought and uh, um, very uh, good one that uh, we achieved. 
and then we come uh, commits to is to deliberate on the what are the problems in the society or what is the problems with the community led adaptation when we have uh, this community led um, initiatives and how uh, this can be transformed to the bigger uh, labor bigger scale you know moving uh, even you know out of the community when we call, go to the country level or inter international level that how we can share the success stories i think that was one of the major uh, achievements that uh, we come out of uh, the, this, this discussions. Uh, so I think, yeah, and but but the, this, the rest of the challenges is not only to get out those um, achievements, but also to make it reach with the donors and partners so that we can scale up, as I, I think mentioned in the uh, in our presentation. So major thing is to scale up. People need more investment, more uh, knowledge, more support, and more engagement that they can connect their dots uh, of the problems to the higher level and get it so have the solution uh, to be delivered in the local level through a local level uh, initiative or the resource that's already in the local level i think that's the major thing that uh, we got and should be thank you thanks anish there you are super popular uh, in in chat so if you could look up the chat and answer questions both you and pauline uh, Pauline, there are quite a few questions that are directed to you in chat, which are very specific. Uh, so if you could look those up as well and answer them, uh, both Anish and you. Uh, I will turn to Marcia next. I am aware that we are super short on time. We have only 10 minutes, so and I think only five minutes for the panel. So Marcia, I have uh, two tough ones for you, actually. Uh, the first one is on measuring LLA. And how do we measure LLA? And I think among the panelists, you would be the person who we can turn to to answer this question. Uh, and two, um, the second one is, are we trying to reinvent the wheel uh, when we are not building on, or when, when we seem to be, or we are perceived as not building on the long history we have of, of development initiative in, uh, in the world and can we not build on those experiences? So both these questions, if you could quickly sort of link the okay. two and answer. Yes, thank you. Very important questions. Measuring locally led adaptation requires also an understanding of the process of how enabling conditions have improved. Um, and it's in many cases as well, a qualitative improvements. So how the level of engagement, how the level of knowledge, capacity, awareness, access to the information or participation or uh, engagement in governance settings. Um, it, is, it, is, it is critical to understand that we are not necessarily, everything can be quantified and say amount of number or percentage, but we have to understand the process and the qualitative change. And it's based as well on how it's improved in awareness, in knowledge, and participation on, on, on behavior that could tell us the story if those efforts to work with communities to enhance the capacity to empower has actually resolved. So, but we have to as well get comfortable with being able to say how this has transitioned and what efforts have been made to improve those conditions. So, we have to speak about them. We have to tell the stories, the lessons, when is easy, what barriers we have, and not, not, not necessarily always um, we have a method to collect that and facilitating those conversations, being able to, to bring that information also forward from the communities is critical. It's not only the methods that we use or what we want to get out of it, but it's also how do we capture the information so that it's actually accurate and help us find ways to improve and be sensitive to those cultural differences that might exist and also social different roles that different members of the community play. In regards of bringing previous lessons learned, I am completely fully agree on this. It's like there is many different agendas, but they all converge one way or another under the lenses of climate. So it adds an extra channel and an extra challenge. It adds, um, it, it, it forces as well that we, that we bring how we can make decisions and how we can enhance adaptation through the lens of climate. So all the experience working with communities, understanding social patterns, all the experience working with deployment nature-based solutions or other activities that are related to, to adaptation will 
will be helpful. I, I, I don't agree to reinvent the wheel. I am fully aware this is not the purpose, but using all that knowledge and acknowledging that knowledge is critical to say where we go forward and how we each time closing the barriers and each time we're getting more lessons and opportunities to accelerate those solutions. Thank you. Those were those were very very valuable answers, and I think I think very on point. Um, thank you for keeping them. I think I've been told we have three extra minutes, uh, but so that's a good thing. I can I can squeeze in some extra questions. Uh, Madeline, I have there are quite a few interesting questions for you, but I have one that that seems really interesting. Um, how can we ensure that there is equality among the LDCs in the implementation of adaptation approaches in terms of distribution of resources, success rates, uh, and other, other options? So uh, over to you in order to answer this question. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Susan. I think it's an important question. Uh, uh, yes, we, 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 we need to, to, to ensure first that all LDCs have access to resources uh, for the adaptation need. I think this is clear. So for LDCs, uh, we, we used to do what we call our NAPA. It was the first document uh, 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 treating the agency on, 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 on taking on board and tackling the issue of adaptation. I, I just want to let you know that the LDCs are the group to bring the issue on adaptation because we are the one who are really uh, 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 seeking this uh, important uh, uh, aspect as a matter of agency and uh, since uh, the, the, the Marrakesh Accord. So this is what uh, we have a through, uh, 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 through the, 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 the NAPA, the LDCF fund. So it's a fund uh, where all LDCs can have access to implement some adaptation projects. So it's, a, uh, it's under the GEF uh, uh, portfolio. We also working through GCF to ensure that all LDCs have also access uh, 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 to resources in order to implement the adaptation need through also uh, the NAPS or the, the, the National Adaptation Plan or through also the NDCs. We also working with the adaptation uh, uh, board uh, fund, the adaptation fund, who is a fund coming from the Kyoto mechanism to ensure that all LDCs countries are in the position to access to resources to implement some adaptation fund. So it's also our mandate to ensure that we enhance the resources allocated for adaptation. And when I'm talking about, I'm talking about doubling the, the, the adaptation finance, and it is a urgent need. So as LDCs, we have to ensure that and ensure that all LDCs countries are implementing and are having access and uh, easy access to this fund in order for communities at the local level uh, uh, to, to implement uh, uh, their, their, their need and adjust their livelihood. I think this is uh, what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll squeeze in just a quick reflection from all of you. Just one more takeaway from each one of you. We'll start with uh, we'll start with Madeline and then go backwards. Uh, Marcia, Pauline, and Anish. Uh, so, Madeline, if you could give like one word reflection, your takeaway from today's conversation. No, what I can say is uh, 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 is uh, really thank you. I think uh, this kind of uh, uh, event. Uh, uh, grabbing all uh, uh, what is going on at the local level on adaptation is key. So we have to show it to the world. We have also to, to ensure that the resource for adaptation is coming and allowing us to scale up all these different uh, experiences you have shared today. I thank you and uh, we continue uh, working closely with you. Thank you so much, Madeline. Marcia? But important takeaway from my side at least is valuing those locally led adaptation opportunities is critical for all actors, for non-state actors on the side of the work that the climate change champions are pursuing, but as well for governments in regards of ensuring that adaptation and resilience happens first at the local level and can be scaled and transform more parts of the world, thanks. Thank you so much. Anish, very quickly, I think we are just about at time. 
Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the major takeaway is uh, this kind of interaction is really um, heartwarming uh, in terms of uh, to we share, we bring stories, and we get inspired. So inspiration is a key of doing anything. Uh, thank so you. Uh, we continue the momentum with inspira inspiration for more inspiration and to uh, have a larger impact. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Th thank you very much. I think uh, for me, uh, take home is that uh, the communities uh, doing a lot at the grassroots level. We need resources directed to these communities, not as uh, beneficiaries, but as, as partners. And like I had said earlier on, the communities don't want to be consulted, they want to be involved, they want to be uh, partners at the table, not as passive listeners, but uh, shaping the conversation as we go move forward. Thank you. And I think I hand over to Sushila for a final plug-in of the CBA. Thank you, Suchi. Thank you, everyone, for this wonderful talk and conversation. Thank you, panel. Thank you, Suchi. Thank you, Salim. And thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you, team, and thank you all the audience who participated, asked the questions, and provided your uh, inputs on uh, LLA. And finally, we would like to announce that the CBA is coming on. As we mentioned, it's already 16 years, so the CBA 16, putting the LLA principles into practice is coming on 3rd and 4th of October. So this will be a virtual conference. There is a link, uh, Amy, can we have the link on the chat so that people can uh, sign up for the updates on CBA and can join on the CBA as well. Uh, and hope to see you on the CBA conference. Thank you, everyone.